You're standing on a massive bridge. Cars are zooming past you, looking down at the water far below. How did this giant concrete and steel monster get here? Did construction workers just throw it across the water and hope for the best? Today, I'll explain how bridges are built over water like you're five years old. And by the end, you'll understand why these engineering marvels don't just fall into the river the moment someone drives across them. Building a bridge over water isn't like building a bridge over your backyard creek with a plank of wood. Water bridges are huge, heavy, and need to stay up for decades while trucks, cars, and sometimes trains cross them every single day. Engineers have to solve some pretty tricky problems. How to build something in the middle of a river. How do you make sure the foundation doesn't just sink into the muddy bottom? How do you get the two sides to meet perfectly in the middle? It's like the world's most complicated puzzle. Except if you mess up, people can't get to work. Let's start with the foundation, because everything else depends on getting this part right. Imagine you're building a sand castle, but instead of building it on the beach, you have to build it underwater while fish are swimming around and waves are trying to knock it over. That's basically what bridge builders face, except their sand castles need to hold up millions of pounds of concrete and steel. First, engineers send down divers to use underwater cameras to look at the river bottom. They need to know what's down there. Is it solid rock, soft mud, sand, old shopping carts, and bicycle tires? The type of bottom determines how they'll build the foundation. If it's solid rock, lucky them. If it's soft mud, that goes down really deep. They have a lot more work to do. For most bridges, engineers use something called a kaisen. I think of a kaisen like a giant empty coffee cup that you push down into the river bottom. But this coffee can is huge, maybe as wide as your house and made of concrete or steel. Workers lower this giant can into the water and they start digging out all the mud and rocks from inside. As they dig deeper, the heavy kaisen sinks further down into the river bottom. But here's the tricky part. They have to keep the water out while they're digging. Imagine trying to dig a hole in your sandbox while your little siblings keep pouring water into it. Engineers solve this by pumping air into the kaisen. The air pressure pushes the water back out, creating a dry workspace down at the bottom. Workers can then climb down inside this giant can and dig in a dry environment, even though they're underwater. It's like having a giant air bubble protecting them. They keep on digging until they hit solid rock, or until they've gone deep enough that the foundation won't budge. Then they fill the kaisen with concrete, creating a massive underwater pillar. This pillar, called a pier, will hold up one section of the bridge. And for a big bridge, they might need several of these piers marching across the river like giant concrete soldiers. But wait, there's more foundation work to do. Each pier needs a footing, which is like a big concrete shoe that spreads the weight out so that the pier doesn't punch through the river bottom like a nail through paper. These footings can be enormous, sometimes bigger than a basketball court and several feet thick. All of this concrete has to be poured underwater, which is about as fun as it sounds. Now that the foundations are done, it's time to build the towers. For big suspension bridges, these towers are the tall, impressive parts that everyone notices. They're like the goalposts of bridge building, except they need to be perfectly straight and incredibly strong. Building towers over water means bringing in floating construction platforms. Picture a giant raft loaded with cranes, concrete mixers, and all the tools needed to build a skyscraper. Except this skyscraper is sitting in the middle of a river. These platforms have to stay perfectly positioned while waves, wind, and river currents try to push them around. It's like trying to build a Lego tower while sitting on a rocking chair. The towers are built piece by piece, section by section. Each section is carefully measured and positioned before concrete is poured or steel beams are bolted into place. Workers have to account for wind, temperature change, and even the curvature of the earth on really long bridges. If they're off by even a few inches at the bottom, the error gets magnified at the top, and suddenly your tower is leaning like it's trying to take a nap. For suspension bridges, these towers need to be incredibly tall and strong because they'll eventually support cables that hold up the entire roadway. The cables will pull on the towers from different directions, trying to bend them or pull them over. The towers have to be built to resist all these forces while still being flexible enough to sway slightly in strong winds. A tower that's too rigid might snap, while one that's too flexible might sway so much that drivers get seasick. Once the towers are complete, it's time for one of the most impressive parts of bridge construction. Installing the cables. For suspension bridges, this means stringing massive cables from one tower to the other. And these aren't the kind of cables you use to charge your phone. These are thick steel cables made up of thousands of individual wires, each one tested to make sure it won't break under pressure. The main cables are installed using a process that looks like the world's most expensive game of connected dots. First, a pilot cable, which is much smaller and lighter, is strung across the gap. This pilot cable is like the first thread in a spider web. Workers can use helicopters to carry this initial cable across, or they can use boats to ferry it from one side to the other. 
Once the pilot cable is in place, they use it to pull progressively larger and stronger cables across the gap. It's like using a piece of string to pull a rope, then using the rope to pull a chain, then using the chain to pull a massive steel cable. Eventually, they have the main suspension cables in place, stretching them from one tower to the other in a graceful curve. But the main cables are just the beginning. Hundreds of smaller cables, called suspender cables, hang down from the main cables like the string on a giant harp. These suspender cables will eventually connect to the bridge deck and support the roadway. Each suspender cable has to be precisely positioned and tensioned so that the bridge deck hangs level and straight. And now comes the part that really tests everyone's math skills. Building the bridge deck and connecting everything together. The bridge deck is the part that cars actually drive on, and it needs to meet up perfectly in the middle, even though construction crews are working from both sides of the river simultaneously. Engineers use incredibly precise measurements and calculations to make sure that both sides of the bridge will line up. They have to account for temperature, which makes materials expand and contract, wind loads, the weight of the bridge itself, and even the rotation of the earth. If the crews working on the north side are off by a few inches, and the crews working on the south side are off by a few inches in the opposite direction, you end up with a gap in the middle of your bridge. And that tends to make for unhappy commuters. The bridge deck is usually built in sections. For some bridges, these sections are built on land and then float out to their final position on barges. Picture trying to parallel park a barge carrying a piece of bridge while dealing with river currents, wind, and waves. It requires incredibly skilled boat operators and very patient construction workers. Each section of bridge deck has to be lifted into place and connected to the suspender cables or support structures. Giant cranes, often mounted on floating platforms, do the heavy lifting. The sections are carefully positioned and then bolted or welted into place. As each section is added, the bridge gets longer and stronger, gradually spanning the gap between the two shores. The connection process requires incredible precision. Engineers use surveying equipment that can measure distances and angles to within fractions of an inch. They constantly check and double check their measurements because once a section is in place and connected, it's extremely difficult and expensive to fix mistakes. As the bridge deck grows from both sides, there's always a dramatic moment when the two halves finally meet in the middle. This is called closing the gap, and it's like the final piece of a jigsaw puzzle. Except this puzzle weighs thousands of tons and people's lives depend on it fitting perfectly. Temperature plays a huge role in this final connection. Steel and concrete expand when they're hot and contract when they're cold. Engineers have to time the final connection for the right temperature conditions so that the bridge will be the correct length when it's finished. Sometimes they have to wait for just the right weather conditions, or even do the final connection at a specific time of day when the temperature is perfect. Throughout this entire process, safety is absolutely critical. Construction workers are operating heavy machinery over deep water, often in challenging weather conditions. They wear safety harnesses, use safety nets, and follow strict protocols to prevent accidents. Despite all these precautions, bridge construction over water remains one of the most dangerous types of construction work. Quality control is also essential. Every weld is inspected, every bolt is checked, and every measurement is verified. Engineers use x-rays to check welds, ultrasonic testing to detect flaws in materials, and load testing to make sure that everything can handle the expected weight and stress. They literally stress test a bridge before anyone is allowed to drive on it. The entire process, from initial planning to final completion, can take several years for a major bridge. Environmental concerns have to be addressed, including protecting fish habitats and minimizing disruption to boat traffic. Construction schedules have to work around weather patterns, shipping schedules, and sometimes even fish migration patterns. But once a bridge is complete, it still needs ongoing maintenance. Bridges over water face constant challenges from salt air, which causes corrosion, changing water levels, which can affect the foundations, the constant stress of traffic loads. Regular inspections, painting, and repairs are necessary to keep the bridge safe and functioning for decades. Modern technology has made bridge construction safer and more precise, but the basic challenges remain the same. Engineers still have to build strong foundations underwater, construct tall towers that won't fall over, install cables that won't break, and connect everything together with incredible precision. It's still one of the most impressive demonstrations of human engineering and teamwork. And so, there you have it. Bridges over water aren't just thrown together and hope for the best. They're carefully engineered marvels that require underwater foundations, precise tower construction, complex cable systems, and incredibly accurate measurements to connect everything together. Engineers have to outsmart water, weather, physics, and occasionally some very stubborn fish. But now you know why these massive structures stay up instead of becoming very expensive artificial reefs. So go forth and cross bridges with newfound appreciation for the army of engineers who made sure that you don't end up taking an unexpected swim.